correction, it's one eighth. We're gonna do one eighth of the onion. So just take, take those onions, put them right in there in the mix. Good afternoon. Um, this is weird. My webcam is on and I'm sitting in front of it. Uh, however, I am not here. Okay. That's weird. I, I guess it's, it's on, but it's not on. So, okay. I, I guess it's off today because it's not turning on. That's fine. That's unfortunate, but it's not updating. So that's that. Okay. Um, yeah. If I restart my computer to get it to work, uh, the recording is going to screw up. So let's just not do that. Uh, last week, we did first language acquisition up to the telegraphic stage. So today we'll continue on with that. I, I guess there are some words because there was the test last week. So the, the results were posted on Thursday last week. It's It's been a while. I marked them quickly. I released them quickly. So it feels like it was ages ago. Um, so I had the announcement out. I'm sure you read that. Um, so I put out the announcement. I'm going to make all of the adjustments that I said I would for the following test. So what will happen is uh, the next test is worth, I think, 5% more than the first test. But you'll end up with like a total of two hours instead of just one hour. So it'll be like a total of 10 points more, but you'll get an additional hour to do the entire thing. So it'll be roughly an hour for the multiple choice part and roughly 45 minutes for the short answer part. So hopefully that will be a little bit better, more multiple choice, less multiple answer. Um, overall though, like I said in the announcement, um, the scores are actually pretty good overall. Um, so the average was 75%, which compared to other offerings of Ling 100, is about 8% higher. So that's pretty good. Typically a Ling 100 exam averages between 65 and 67%. So 75% is incredibly good in this course. So, um, but like I said, it's not just about the results that matter. It's about how it feels. So we will be making those adjustments. Okay. Um, if you have any questions about that or any questions about the test, uh, you can see your results. So I'm sure you've already looked at those, but if you have specific questions, you can always leave a comment on them. So I don't have a way that I can show you how to do that on my end without actually pulling up one of your tests and looking at them, which is not okay for me to do, but you have this area that you can put comments on them on the test. So if you leave a comment on your test, I get an email. So that's a great way that you can just ask a question and it'll show up on my end and I can access your test immediately from that comment and I can respond to you there. So if you have a question about one of your questions and you don't want to email me and do all that work, just comment directly on your test and I can access it from there. Um, same goes for your assignment. If you have a question about that, those grades were just released. Uh, I checked through them quickly, but the TAs did all the grading there. Question one was marked by Sarah. Question two was marked by Jesse. So if you have questions about that, uh, you can contact them or leave a question on your assignment there. Um, I'll most likely address it rather than them, um, but I will check with them in case something weird happened. Uh, assignment two is available now. We can talk about that at the end, um, but that covers writing systems and languages. There's an instructional video on the front page. so. Uh, you can check that out, but it's all pretty self-explanatory from the assignment. And by the end of today, you should be able to do the first three questions. And by the end of next week, you should be able to do the last question. Uh, the neurolinguistics lecture is next week, and it shouldn't take up the full three hours. So we should have a, a roughly like two-hour lecture next week. Okay, um, that's all the housekeeping stuff I have to start. Um, yeah, before we start the content, are there any questions from last week or any housekeeping questions that you might have or feedback or 
uh, whatever. This, this is weird. I can't see myself. <laughs> I can't see a face on the screen. It's still just a chair. Maybe you'll even join back in. Uh, I use a different program for this. Um, I use Zoom's webcam. Does it work? That's a good question. Unplug it and plug it back in. Uh, it's it's not quite that simple. Try an OBS. Try redoing your camera capture. Yeah, it's it's more like a power supply issue than a software issue. So that's why it's not quite that simple, unfortunately. Um, during the break, I'll, I'll figure some some weird thing out. But anyways, let's just continue on with first language acquisition, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll find a workaround in the break. That's not my face, but also my face at the same time. Okay, so we worked up to about two years old last time. So we just finished up with the two word stage and sort of where we were at was that children could not produce full sentences, but they have like some semblance of syntactic structure and they could say things like mummy sock or sorry, mummy sock to produce, um, sorry, they could say things like mummy sock to convey full sentences, uh, with roughly the same word order. So mummy sock could mean mummy sock. It could mean mummy, I want your sock. It could mean mummy, I need you to get daddy's sock. Uh, so if I go back to that previous slide, uh, the word order is the same and it represents full ideas, but all they can do is produce two words. The telegraphic stage is the next stage. So this is where they can start to string more words together. So you see more complex things, like instead of a full sentence, like mother gave Susie lunch in the kitchen, you'll start to see three, four, five words. And these are just all the content words. So you'll see things like, um, I ride horsey. So this is where we start to get to three word examples or give doggy paper or put truck window, Adam put it box. So what you notice here is that there's a specific word order here. It follows English word order, but uh, we're missing certain types of words. We're missing prepositions like in or on or at. And we're also missing uh, words like determiners or articles like the or a uh or an. So these are what are known as function words. So we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the first language acquisition lecture. So typically in the telegraphic stage, we don't have function words. And uh, the telegraphic stage is called the telegraphic stage. Uh, you might think of like telegrams and uh, I don't know, like the World War documentaries where they get Morse code or little um, paper messages that's just like, um, you know, give notice to us like very, very quick messages that eliminate all of these function words that just send the main content, like uh, need help, send supply. Instead of I need help, please send your supplies or please send some supplies. It's just like send supplies, need help. So uh, you might have noticed that a lot of these function words you don't actually need for comprehension. And sometimes when they're missing, you might not even notice them. It depends which ones are missing. So in these examples, we don't have any with the word is, but you'll see a lot of children in this stage forget to use the word is or are. So there's actually one sentence in the paragraph on the left that is missing this word as well, sort of as a nod to this. Um, words not randomly strung together. You know, we're missing an R here. Words are not randomly strung together. 
but uh, you might not have noticed it. And kids will do this too at this stage. Instead of saying words are not, they'll say words not. Because uh, this, in this case, this is, I mean, this, this is a content word, but functionally it's not necessary. So in the telegraphic stage, again, we see sentence structure emerging. Uh, is that sentence grammatically incorrect? I mean, a lot of these sentences that they're producing are grammatically incorrect at this point, um, but they still follow the sentence structure. So all of these, uh, the one that I used, words not randomly strung together. Yeah, that's grammatically incorrect. We need an R there for it to be grammatically correct, um, but you can still understand it. And so like all of these, um, I'm just checking. All of these are grammatically incorrect, but uh, the word order is there. So, so children are building to the correct word order here. They're building to complete grammaticality. Uh, there's nothing here that's, that's super weird for English. It's not like the subject is going after. Um, it's not like the recipient is occurring before the verb or anything like that. In fact, in this chart, for some reason, give is uh, in the subject instead of in the verb there. That's one mistake in the chart. Okay, so that's the telegraphic stage. Um, so this is sentence structure, but of course, uh, there's other things going on in sentence structure. Uh, we start to get morpheme acquisition too. So uh, this, this is from two to three years old, we start to see this. So the telegraphic stage um, isn't just a six month period like the other ones. This is a, a little bit of a longer period. So about a year into it, um, grammatical words do start to emerge, or grammatical morphemes. And there's a specific order or a sequential order that most kids follow. So not 100% of kids are going to follow this order, but the vast majority of kids will follow this order. So uh, usually the first thing that kids acquire is going to be the ing. So they'll start to use sleeping, running, eating. So like, uh, mom sleeping. That would be an utterance they would say early in the telegraphic stage, mom sleeping. And if you notice down later in the chart, the final thing that they're gonna acquire is this auxiliary is or was or are. So they don't actually say mom is sleeping until the very end of their morpheme acquisition. So uh, this is sort of interesting that they acquire the ing, the content really early, but they don't acquire that is to make it grammatical until the very end. And if you remember back in that second lecture about animal communication with redundancy, uh, there's sort of a reason why. It's because that is walking just makes it sound grammatical, but the content ing, that progressive continual event, like currently sleeping, currently running, currently eating, that information's already there with the ing. Uh, that is is just there for grammatical purposes. So is walking, is sleeping, was sleeping. Um, it makes sense they acquire it later because this is really just uh, redundant information. It's redundant, we need it to be grammatical. We need it to sound right, uh, but it is redundant content, so the child can learn it later. Uh, typically, the plural is before the possessive, so dogs, cats, tables to mean more than one. Possessive comes after, then they learn the articles, they learn past tense, they learn agreement, so he eats, she sleeps. Again, this information here is redundant too. He eats, she sleeps. Uh, if you say he eat or she sleep, you still understand it. It just sounds more grammatical. It's proper English sentence structure if you get that agreement for he or she uh, on your verb. But things like past tense, jumped versus jump, this is important information. The toy versus a toy, this is important information. Uh, mummy's dog versus mummy dog, that's important information. Uh, one other thing to note here, which is a concern that parents often have, uh, I should say like linguistically naive parents, is that you have plural S, possessive S, 
and third person singular s. And these all sound the same. So some parents have questions like, how come my kid can say, I have two dogs, but they can't say mommy's dogs? Because they just sound the same. Um, so it's not just about pronunciation. It's not like the child can now pronounce S or Z, and now the child can use everything with S and Z. Um, this is about morphemes. It's about meaning. So children actually acquire meaning, grammatical meaning in different stages. It's not just about pronunciation. So uh, this is evident by the fact that we have three morphemes with the same pronunciations being acquired in different stages. So uh, that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, so at some point you might have to reference this chart. So I would just make a note that this chart does exist on page 21. Uh, obviously not something you have to memorize and something that's open book in this course. And I'll try to repeat it when you do need it, um, but just be aware that this chart uh, does exist in this slide. Okay, um, now the final thing that's acquired in this stage is something that's beyond the grammar. And we call this pragmatics. So pragmatics relates to understanding conversation and how to talk to others. So um, this is usually like the last thing that people acquire when they learn a second language. And it's one of the later things that you acquire in a first language as well. So how to use polite language, uh, how to properly address others, um, when it's appropriate to say certain things and not to say certain things. So, you know, uh, sometimes uh, when you wanna tell people to be quiet, you can tell someone to shut up or you can say, can you please be quiet? Uh, later in life, when you learn to write emails, you learn the difference between saying, hey, versus dear versus, um, you know, hello. There are differences depending on who you're typing to. Um, this one's important too. So this might be really obvious to some of you, what B is saying here. So A says, can you answer the phone? B says, I'm watching Russian slap fights and A says, okay. So it's obvious that B is saying no. Uh, B cannot answer the phone here, but this is not obvious to kids, <laughs> uh, especially when they're like two or three years old, if they can even ask this question in the first place. Uh, they just want a yes or no answer. So this is part of pragmatics, uh, understanding that when someone says they're doing something else or doesn't directly answer the question, they're giving an indirect response. So. It's being able to understand non-literal language. So I guess uh, let me just type this out um, as another way. Well, that's way too small. That is. Um, so I don't even understand what is happening. Pragmatics, uh, non-literal language could be another way of expressing that. So all of these things are picked up between around two to four years old, or at least this is when children start to pick things up. Now, it's not gonna be mastered at this point, but this will be when children start to work on things. So here's the big question, and I think uh, we've had some questions throughout the course in a couple weeks on uh, how is language actually acquired? And there are always some questions. Is it imitation? Do you learn language by repeating things that you hear? Um, is there some sort of reward system where you say things that are correct, and then because you were given a reward of some sort, uh, you've learned, okay, when I say this, it's good, therefore I'll keep saying it. 
or are you just subconsciously taking in information, learning rules, and then applying those rules? So you don't need rewards. You don't need to imitate. Uh, which one is it? Because reinforcement, this is very uh, animalistic in a way. So this is how animals have been learning languages with the animal studies. Um, imitation, sort of what parrots do. Rule formation is, is a lot more complex brain behavior. So let's think about each of these. And let's just take a look at some data here. So let's just take a look at each of these. So A, um, what's happening in A here? We have some utterances by a child. So everything in A is something that a child has said. Uh, oh, my pencil, two foot, what the boy hit, other one pants, mommy, get it, my ladder, cowboy did fighting me. Uh, do you think that the things in A could be things that a child is imitating? Mummy, get it, my ladder. Cowboy did fighting me. Are those things that a child could imitate? No. Because where, where would a child hear those things? Cowboy did fighting me. Uh, no adult is going to say those things. So um, a, a child won't hear these. So it's not imitation here. Uh, these are utterances that a child has created on its own, specifically for A. Uh, and if we take a look at B, C, and D, uh, he's going out, the adult says, and the child says, he go out. Uh, in C, that's an old time train, the child says, old time train. So there's, there's partial imitation here, not the whole thing, but some of it. Uh, the adult in D says, where can I put them? And the child says, where I can put them. So uh, almost full, but they swapped the subject and the modal there. So the question formation wasn't completely the same. So it's not really imitation here, how a child's learning. The child tries, but What's being shown here is that the child is understanding the general message, but the child can only produce what the child's grammar allows him or her, or it, I'll just say it, to, sorry, that's just, how, you can tell how I feel about children. Uh, the child can only produce what its grammar allows it to produce. Uh, so here's, here's another example. Sorry, no, I, I love children just when they're like, nowhere near me, especially. Um, so here's, here's another example. Uh, want one other spoon, daddy? Uh, you mean you want the other spoon? Yes, I want other one spoon. Uh, can you say the other spoon? Uh, here's, here's the error repeated again. Other one spoon? Okay, so say other, other, spoon, spoon. Other spoon. Okay, other spoon. Oh, good, he did it. Genius child. Uh, now give me other one spoon and suddenly the error is back. Okay. So imitation uh, isn't really working here. The, the child did get it, but then when the child goes back to producing the utterance, um, suddenly it's, it's problematic again. So this, this is not imitation. Uh, children do not learn their grammar through imitation there. That's not it there, that's, that's the right word. I'll, I'll be nice to children. So uh, these, these couple slides just sort of explain uh, what we see. Yeah, you see it in adults as well. You, you definitely see it in adults as well, <laughs> but it's much more common with children. So um, it's not imitation. Uh, we see them producing things they could have never possibly heard before. So it can't be imitation. And even when they do try to imitate what they hear, uh, they make mistakes. They can only produce what their brains allow them for, to produce at that point in time. Um, so is it reinforcement? Uh, could it be that they hear things, or sorry, that they say things, and then the parents uh, reward them for saying things that are grammatical and then the 
child uh, understands that and then they repeatedly say things that are right. Well, this could partially explain things, but parents don't actually reward children for saying things that are grammatically correct. Um, because parents usually just focus on the content of what kids say and not the grammatical structure. So here's, here's something you actually will see. Uh, a child says something like, mama isn't a boy, he's a girl. Okay, so here's, here's a pronoun thing going on. This should be she, because it's, it's mama, mama is, is a she. But you'll hear a parent respond and say, yeah, that's right. Because the parent isn't actually paying that much attention to what's being said, or they'll ignore it, um, or they'll say, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just, a, it's just one word. But, you know, the parent doesn't have that much attention to give to a child all day to correct every single utterance. So, yeah, that's right. Mama isn't a boy. He's a girl. Yeah, mama's a girl. That's, that's enough. So it's probably not reinforcement. Uh, parents don't often correct their children. Yeah, that's enough. Now leave me alone. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, what I want to say about reinforcement uh, with children and language learning is that if we do want to claim that reinforcement has some sort of effect, this is one of those cases where you would have to monitor a parent and a child in an environment for a long time. Like you'd have to bring them in when a child is fairly young in a controlled environment and have a parent that is on the ball all the time correcting uh, <laughs> a child's utterances and corre uh, so correcting them when they're wrong and rewarding them when they're correct and seeing the outcome and comparing it with children who don't have that sort of correction. And you have to run multiple trials with multiple parent and child pairs. So to actually fully test reinforcement would be something that's very difficult, uh, especially with ethics. So from the limited data that we have and from what we know about how children are raised by parents and how parents react, um, reinforcement is just very unlikely. It probably contributes a little bit, a very, very little bit, but it just doesn't happen often. So um, what's actually happening is a lot of language learning is just rule formation. And we can say it's rule formation because we can see evidence of syntactic progress and syntactic changes as children age. And we can see consistent patterns across all children as they age. And they all follow very similar patterns if you look at babies within the same language. Um, obviously, if you look at children in different languages, they have different syntactic structures. And um, so if you look at all, say, all Mandarin speaking babies, um, all Mandarin speaking babies will follow the same patterns within Mandarin but they may be a different order and different structures, but they'll follow the same patterns within that language. Um, English babies will do the same, Greek babies will do the same, uh, but the patterns will differ across languages. So um, for example, here is rule formation for negation across babies in English. So um, children start very simple and as they get older, things get more complicated, obviously, because that's how you would expect things to work. Um, I shouldn't say that's how you should expect things to work because there are some cases where that's not true. Uh, I will see. Um, but something like uh, negation is complex with adults. So typically in the one word stage, you only need something like no. And no expresses a lot of things. Like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, no, don't give me that. No, I'm full, all gone, I don't have any. So these are all single negative words that express a wide range of sentences. Um, as children can start to produce two words in the telegraphic stages in full sentences, they start to add just a, one negative word at the beginning of a sentence. 
So a very simple rule. Then as they start to learn a little bit more, they start to do more complicated things until they finally get to the um, proper technique. So uh, they learn that negation doesn't just go at the beginning of the sentence. So they start to put it right before the verb, which is where it should be. So Fraser, no want some, I no taste them. Uh, they start to contract them. So I can't catch you, I don't like him. So these sentences sound perfectly adult-like, but there are still some cases like I not heard him, I didn't did it, uh, that don't sound very good. Uh, but then you start getting some more complex things like I didn't want no food, I didn't want any food. And depending on what type of uh, dialect you speak, both of these can sound okay. So I didn't want no food is completely fine in many dialects of English, but I didn't want any food would be considered a, a more perfect form. So they start simple, and over time, they just tweak their rules inside their head. This is all subconscious. They're not aware of this, but it progresses over time. So this is a nice rule because it starts simple, it gets complex, and there's no real backwards progression, or sorry, a backwards regression. Um, they don't really go backwards once they start to make progress. Um, but there are some cases where children seem to be very, very smart at the beginning, but then they get a little bit older and they appear as if they're getting dumber. Um, <laughs> and uh, parents do get concerned about this. So this is actually really important to know if you have kids or if you know someone who has kids. Um, okay, so this is called U-shaped development. And what happens is when kids are quite young, and we're going to use the past tense ED for this, uh, they just learn words separately. So they are learning words like kissed and walked and helped. So they're learning all these regular verbs and they're learning irregular verbs. So they learn a word like went. Okay. So uh, I'm going to actually just put this here. So here's stage one. They know the word go and they know the word went, but they do not know that go and went are essentially the same word, but one is present tense and one is past. They think that these are separate words, like this is word one and this is word two. So this is the initial stage. So when they speak, the parents are like, oh, you're a genius. You know that go is present tense and went is the past tense. So they're, they're at this stage right here where they're right. Um, but then over time, uh, they get to stage two in their development. And they start saying go, and they learn about the past tense. They start developing rules for the past tense. And they start saying go. So this is in this stage right here. And at this stage, they've unified these words and they know they're just one word. So they've overgeneralized the rule. Um, went is now out of their brain. They understand that go has a past tense and they start saying goad. So they have to relearn in stage three that go has an irregular past tense. And eventually they will pick up the fact that it is went and that this again is just one word in the third stage and they'll pick it up again. So this is called U-shaped learning because they're right at the beginning. They learn a rule over time that they overgeneralize. So they get things wrong, but then eventually they learn again that there are irregular patterns and they pick up the proper word again. Uh, this is also shown by how they gain and then lose theory of mind with the Sally Ann test, right? Um, lose theory of the Sally Ann test. Sally Ann test. Why is my mind blanking with the Sally Ann test? 
Um, that is with the doll, right? That's with the doll. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the theory of mine. So, okay, that's a that's an autistic test. Yeah, that's that's in psychology. That's a test for autism. Um, so I won't quite go into that, but it's this for people who know it. It's roughly the same idea. Um, there is a lot of U-shaped learning in psychology. That's all I'll say. But specifically in linguistics, it's basically the ability where you do something right at first. Um, because uh, for, for whatever reason, but over time you learn um, some sort of rule that you overgeneralize. And because you've learned the rule or you've learned the ability, you start to make mistakes and get things wrong. Uh, then you practice a bit more and then eventually you get things right again. So this doesn't just happen with past tense. Uh, this will happen with plurals as well. So basically anything, uh, anything uh, with irregular patterns or forms. So you can imagine um, uh, goose and geese. A child will originally say geese. In this stage, they learn about plurals and they say gooses. And then eventually they learn again that it is geese. So that's an example with uh, plural S. Okay, are there any questions about U-shaped development or anything we've talked about so far? Would U-shaped development happen in other languages? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you, so a lot of the things that we're talking about here, I'm just illustrating in English, but U-shaped development is something that will happen in any language. Um, can a child get stuck at the bottom? Typically, no, unless the child has language learning disorders, but usually they can overcome them with assistance. Is the concept of U-shaped learning unique to learning languages? No, it's not uh, unique to learning languages. Um, how, how low the U goes is going to depend on the thing that you're learning. But you'll find it a lot when you um, work with any sort of activity or any sort of skill. A lot of people will play video games and they'll focus on a certain concept and they'll be really good. Uh, they'll start to go back to basics or change their form, or even in sports, they'll change their form. Um, and then uh, while they're working on that, they'll start to suffer a bit while they adjust to a new thing. And then it takes a bit of time to adjust to that new form or whatever they're doing until they start to get better again. So this is all U-shaped development. When you're at the bottom, it's very easy to give up. Uh, luckily with U-shaped development though, with children and language learning, it's subconscious, so they can't give up. Uh, they just get to the top. When you're an adult, uh, you know, it's not subconscious, it takes effort. So it's a lot easier to give up. Uh, but when you hit the bottom of the U, you just have to stand upside down and it becomes an N, right? That's, that's useless advice. Anyway, let's think about these words. So how might children pronounce these words? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's why it's useless advice. Okay, so uh, how might a child pronounce mice if they're stuck at the bottom of the U? Well, this is an irregular form. 
So they're probably going to say mouses. Yeah, because the, the singular form is mouse. So they know that you just attach an S to make a plural form. So you're going to get mouses. Uh, what about eight? Eight is the past tense of eat. So what do you normally do? Yeah, eat it. Uh, what about has? So here the base form is have. Oh, so it would just be he. Sorry, I kind of gave it away here. Instead of he has a car, you wouldn't know to put that third person marker. So you just use have. He have a car. That would probably be what the child says. So they wouldn't know that have is supposed to become has after he. So I, I give the context sentence there to give a little hint of um, how it how it would be used. So he have a car is what a child would probably say. Um, what would the past tense of hit? Might they say haves? Um, haves, haves might be said as well. That could be another thing that would be said. A hitted. Yeah, hitted would be likely. Um, this is one of those words you hear adults say all the time as well. Uh, himself. There's a few ways that himself might be said. Uh, how would himself or how might himself be said? Uh, he likes him. Uh, so it might not just be him because I think the idea is that self would be attached to some bit. So it might be uh, his self might be a way that it's said, or maybe he self. So this, his self is probably a little bit more likely. Um, and the reason I say this is because when you think about words like myself, um, my is the possessive form. So you just add self to that. So myself, you self, they self, uh, his self, herself. Um, it just follows a very simple pattern there. But there's different ways it could show up. So he self might be one. Um, maybe the child just does just say him. I mean, there's different variations, but my expectation would be probably his self. So these are all potential errors that, you know, kids could make based on U-shaped learning. So just follow a simple rule and apply it incorrectly to these irregular forms. Next time you find a kid, listen to them talk as long as you can handle it. So see if you can hear any of these. Okay, find a kid. <laughs> find a kid you know. I should be very specific when I say that. Oh. This, this is a very famous test. So this is the WUG test. Um, if I didn't talk about the WUG test, I think I'd be like shot into a cannon into the sun as a linguist. Um, this is a WUG. So this is a WUG. Okay, we're, we're just going to do this test. So please, please en entertain me here. Uh, this is a WUG. Uh, now, there is another one. There are two of them. There are two. Uh, fill in the blank, please. Okay, so you can type it. I just realized this isn't working because none of you are saying it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to say it out loud. How is the S pronounced in that word? Please type it in IPA characters. <laughs> See, thank you. Thank you. There are two wugs. <laughs> okay. Um, wow, that almost didn't work. Uh, okay. So the point of this task is to see, one, if children know how to form the plural, but two, if the children know how to pronounce it subconsciously. So um, if a child is properly acquiring the plural morpheme, they should be able to say wugs and they should be pronouncing it with a Z in English rather than an S. So this is called the wug test. It was very famous and it just showed that children have uh, internalized grammar. So very popular test uh, back in the 60s. That's called the wug test.
And you'll see these on all of the merchandise from the Linguistic Student Union, which I believe might be on sale right now. I'm not plugging for them. Um, but the Linguistic Student Union does sell merchandise and it looks kind of nice. You can find them on Facebook. Okay. Okay, children learn words. It's another thing children do. Uh, here's a fact you probably know. Uh, when children are exposed to learn to words and language, they develop more words faster. So uh, all of the rumors you might have heard as a kid that parents who read to their kids, those kids tend to do better in school because they learn language faster, they learn to read faster, they have advanced vocabulary. Yeah, it's true. Um, kids who read at a young age tend to learn more vocabulary. And because of that, they also tend to learn to read faster. They tend to do better in school because they are able to follow instructions. They're able to read books. They're able to explore more. Um, this is a fact about language learning. It doesn't matter what language you're learning. Um, if you're exposed to more words as a kid, um, you typically do better in school. So there's advice. If you do have kids, uh, read to them as much as possible. Okay. So children can learn words, but how do we know that children even know what those words mean? Well, uh, children make mistakes with words. And we talked about that a bit when they say things that are too narrow or too broad. So we have words for these, um, overextension and underextension. Um, is there a level of things they should be read? Uh, I mean, a level of things they should be read. Uh, something, I mean, you never want to read things that are too developed. Uh, there's always the graded reader series. If you don't want to, sorry, you don't want specific advice here. Uh, the Bible, the Bible. I mean, uh, books aimed typically for children are fine at a young age. Uh, So children typically pick up the names of objects and actions first when they're younger. So if you read books that teach them a lot of names of objects and actions, this will be helpful for their vocabulary until the age of five and six. At that point, you can start reading more advanced things. But when they're young, you want to expose them to a lot of nouns and a lot of action words and a lot of adjectives and descriptions. Um, so, I mean, the problem here with learning words is that, you know, uh, what does a word mean when a child says that's a cat? So overextension of something is too broad. So, for instance, if they think that a cat is anything that's all four-legged animals or underextension of something is too narrow. So if cat is like specifically just like this orange cat here. So um, you see this quite a lot with kids. So, um, uh, they, they can do this based on anything. Uh, and it's tough to find a specific pattern to how children do this. So, um, they can do it based on like the shape of something, the texture of something, the sound something makes, the color of something, um, whether it's alive or dead. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, ch children are, are, are wild animals wild creatures in, in the total opposite sense of what actual wild creatures are um so like a child can say doggy and this is what they mean by doggy they mean all of these things so this is an example of overextension overextension uh because they're using the term doggy which is really just this to refer to all four-legged animals. So they're overextending the term doggy to mean a bunch of different things. So typically overextension happens more than underextension. And this is how children typically acquire language. They just assume that a word means something more general and over time they narrow down the meaning. Now look at all those chickens. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. So we have, okay, we'll just 
do this one. Okay, so it's not quite clear how children narrow down, but there's a few different assumptions for how these work. Uh, one is called the whole object assumption. So the idea is that at first, when a child sees a new word, it just refers to the whole object. So if a child sees a picture of a can and you say, and you point at like the tab of a can and you say, that's a tab, like to open the can, uh, they'll just assume that tab means the entire can. So, um, you know, like say a light switch. Oh, there's a light switch. I can, I can kind of draw a light switch and you say, uh, that's the switch. They'll just assume that this entire thing is the switch then. Even if it's just a little part, or if you want to call it a knob or whatever. Um, there's something called the type assumption. So the new word refers to a type of thing, not just a particular thing. So if you have like this, and you call this a jug, they might assume that any container is called a jug. Um, but typically, uh, children learn what's called the basic level assumption. So that um, a new word refers to objects that are alike in basic ways. So um, what happens is that a child will learn specific examples of a term before learning like what's called the superordinate term. So we call this a larger class word, but this is really called what's called a superordinate term. So um, uh, examples before a general term. So this is how children typically learn words. So um, before they learn like the term fruit, So uh, apple, banana, kiwi, pear, strawberry, before fruit. That would be how they learn it. So that way, when they learn the term fruit, they already know examples of fruit. Uh, children also use a lot of technical, or sorry, a lot of technical, a lot of contextual clues. So they can determine categories. Like if you say that is Dax versus that is a Dax, uh, they would be able to tell whether it's a proper name or a noun just by hearing for a. Even if they can't produce determiners at their stage in development, they can still figure out word categories based on context. So like I said before, with the one word stage and two word stage and the fish phenomena, or for the fist phenomena, um, even if a child can't produce certain things, they can still listen for them and understand them. So they're still determining word categories in their heads based on context, even without producing them. Okay. So we only have like three slides left for first language acquisition, but I'll give you a 10 minute break and then we'll uh, come back and do them. So if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat and I'll answer them when I get back, or um, you can save them for voice when we get back. So I will see you in 10 minutes. Okay, are there any questions from before the break? Ah, there's my replacement.
Uh, the deep voice might not match, but it does look better. So uh, in the end, uh, it's it, it works. Okay. I mean, if there are questions, of course, feel free to keep typing, but So I mean the, the last slide here is really just like a summary of of of, of everything. Uh, children are able to just learn language without any sort of instruction. They're able to subconsciously pick it up from their environment just from listening to people talk. Uh, they're able to develop and construct rules in their head for how grammar works. And what's amazing compared to second language learning is that they'll develop these rules and acquire language, even though a lot of what they hear has errors in it, even though there's a lot of mistakes. So imagine if you learned a language in a course or in a classroom or even out in the world, and 20% of what you heard was filled with errors. You'd have a lot of difficulty figuring out what was accurate especially if you didn't have instruction for what was accurate. But children are able to figure out what's right, even without being told, even with so many errors, so many incomplete sentences, uh, so many speech mistakes. Um, it's, it's really incredible in so many ways. Uh, so children don't need any sort of instruction. Uh, but that leads to a question then, why do children take so long to start speaking? If children can learn language and acquire it without needing any sort of real instruction, why don't they speak earlier? Uh, and there's really two things, um, and they're all around the physical aspect. Uh, first is the mouth. Uh, children just can't speak uh, because their vocal tract isn't ready for it. Uh, when they're first born, um, but their mouth is a lot more like a monkey's. So we saw earlier in lecture two uh, how their, their mouth is shaped. So uh, their larynx is up higher. So as they grow older, their larynx goes downwards. Uh, so their tongue has more movement. It can move forward and back to produce the vowels and consonants that they can make, um, but also their brain. So uh, the idea is that early on, the brain is tuned for sounds. Uh, sounds is very low level information. Um, whether they can discriminate between S and T and all these other sounds, um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, complexity to that. But over time, as their grains grow, uh, grains, as their brains grow, they develop more uh, gray matter, then uh, the more complex aspects of language come in. So uh, things like morphological development, syntactic development, the language centers develop. Um, therefore, there's room and time for uh, you know, the rest of language to develop. You get more synapses, more neurons, and all that stuff come in too. So uh, it does take time for the brain to develop and for the vocal tract to develop. So babies can't just talk uh, one to two years out of the gate. Uh, they need time to develop language. Um, but it is important that children receive input at every stage in their life. Um, and we, this is something called a critical period. And we talked about this a little bit with birds and cultural transmission, where if animals don't receive input during a certain time and they need it to develop their system, and they just cannot learn it later in life. And the same goes for humans, unfortunately. So Jeannie is what's called a feral child. And she is one of the few out there who um, did not get language input as a kid and was discovered later in life um, and exposed to language later in life. And unfortunately, um, because children like Jeannie uh, did not get early exposure to language. Um, these feral children have not been able to ever actually acquire a first language the same way that adults have. Um, so Jeannie, um, so, okay, so 
Yeah. Uh, Jeannie was found at 13 years old um, on her own. She was given extensive language training because she just could not speak at all when she was found. Um, and even with all this training, without being exposed to any language for the first 13 years of her life, um, this is the most that she could produce. The stuff like man, motorcycle, have, genie, full stomach, open door, key. So this is someone who is still intelligent, who can still do things, who still has fine motor control, um, who still has fine reasoning ability. But the language center of her brain was not used during the critical period. So the language center of her brain is no longer able to acquire language the same way that other children and adults are able to. Um, so if an individual were to be trapped in a room or secluded for an extended period of time, would they lose their language abilities? Um, no, I don't think there's any evidence of that. Um, once you acquire a language, you're never going to fully lose it. Um, it might be a bit more difficult to acquire a second language later in life. Like you might lose a lot of words, but you're never going to lose your syntactic patterns because you can still think. You can still think about it. Uh, you can still talk to yourself inside your head at the very least. Um, I, I I don't actually know because there's never been evidence of it, but based on what I know about linguistics, I don't think that would happen. Uh, how does her thought process work? I'm not entirely sure how her thought process works. Um, that's actually a really tough question. It's, it's hard to gauge what her thought process is um, without being able to actually hear her talk, right? Um, all I know is experimental results from her and what her caretakers have said about her and sort of the results that have come out of it. Um, is she still alive? I believe she passed away quite young. Um, uh, Jeannie death. Um, yeah, she died quite young. Oh, is she still alive? No, she's not dead. She's still alive. She is still alive. Yeah, the wiki page is quite massive. If you do want to take a look through it, there's a lot of information on her. Um, she's not dead. She's not the only feral child. Um, most, like, unfortunately, she's not the only feral child. Um, a lot of feral children do end up dying quite young. Um, and a lot of the feral children who would be alive obviously do not <laughs> prefer not to have their information out in the public. So actually, I didn't know that she was still alive. I thought she had died because a lot of them have unfortunately passed away. Yeah. Um, but there is evidence, but it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but thanks to children like um, Jeannie, these, the, the stories are quite sad. There's always, it's unfortunate that it happened, but thanks to studies like this, um, we have become aware that there are critical periods in humans as well. So if we do not acquire language early in life, and usually this is before the age of seven, we say. Um, if we don't have exposure to language before seven, then we just cannot ever acquire it in a native like, um, like a, as a native speaker. We'll never quite acquire it in the same way. So there is one term here that I have on the page, pigeon-like. Um, this is a term that we haven't discussed. Um, a, a pigeon is essentially not quite a language. So it's a set of content words that doesn't have a grammatical structure to it. So 
Um, it is explained here, but if you ask like, what does pigeon like mean? Um, it's just a bunch of content words without much grammatical structure or function words. So exactly what you see there, man, motorcycle, have, genie, full stomach. Um, not, not quite what natural language has. So yeah, that's what we have for first language acquisition. Um, if you do want to actually see some videos on Jeannie, if you just go to YouTube and type in Jeannie, there's there's so much on her, um, so much on feral children in general. Okay, any, con any questions about first language acquisition before we move on to second language acquisition and contrast it? What about acquiring accents? Like there seems to be an age cutoff for that. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that a little bit in second language acquisition, but typically um, before the age of seven, you'll acquire the accent that's around you. Um, between seven and 14, uh, your accent can change uh, if you focus on it while you're learning some other language. Um, after 14 though, you'll typically stay with the same accent that you've had since before 14. Uh, that age is a rough number though. It's gonna vary from person to person, um, but that's, that's the general trend. Is around 14 years old, your accent will be fossilized. So if you ever see like a 21 year old friend who goes on vacation to like Europe and then comes back with a different accent, uh, they're faking it. but you already knew that. <laughs> okay, let's talk about second language acquisition. Um, there's a bit of, of bilingualism from slide 66 onwards. We're not gonna do bilingualism, but it's uh, there. Uh, just so you're aware. So there's nothing on the test for bilingualism, nothing on the assignments, and nothing on the practice exercise just for time's sake, but it is there for your information. So here's some terminology, just in case uh, you haven't seen this, and if you haven't taken linguistics courses, you probably haven't, but just so we have it here. Uh, SLA is short for second language acquisition. Sometimes we use L2A. Um, L1, L2, L3 are really the most important terms here. So L1 means uh, first language. So uh, first language, just because you see L1, you can have more than one L1. Uh, the L1s are the languages that you grew up speaking. So grow up speaking. So like before the age of five, usually. Um, L2 is any language that you learned usually after the age of five. So foreign language or non-native language. So you can have multiple L2s. So um, after five, um, if you call yourself an L2 speaker or learner, then that means that you speak that language or speak that second language. So, um, you know, if you've learned English after age 10, then you're an L2 English speaker. Uh, if you learned English as a newborn baby, then you're an L1 English speaker. Occasionally, you use terms like L3, L4, but these are actually very rarely used. Um, we typically just use L2 to um, mean everything after the second language. Because whether you learn something as a third language or fourth language or fifth language, nothing really changes. Um, the difference between someone's sixth language and their second language is usually just how quickly they acquire it. But the um, process, the patterns, um, the systematic step-by-step uh, -step process, is, is, it's the same. It's just how fast that goes. Uh, B, the one I didn't talk about called target language. Uh, TL. Uh, typically, we don't actually abbreviate this all that much, um, but this is just the language that someone is trying to acquire. 
So the target of your study. So if you're learning uh, Cantonese, then your target language is Cantonese. If you're learning Greek, your target language is Greek. Okay, so the most common terms you'll see are um, L2 and L1. Absolutely, these are the ones that you need to know. Okay, so let's take some educated guesses here. So read these and I'll actually make the poll with true or false and we'll uh, try this out. So I'm gonna work on making the poll. This is L2 acquisition. Okay, let me just number these. That's one, that's two, that's three, and that's four. And let's launch this and see what you all have to say. For those of you who have learned a second language, some of these might be um, a little bit easier to guess than those of you who haven't. Okay, so we can talk about each of these. Uh, we'll talk about the ones that most of you got Right, first, oh, they're, they're coming in fast and furious now. Okay, one, L2 learners can acquire structures and segments that are absent from their L1. So like Japanese learners can acquire Russian R. Um, the, the, this is true. So uh, no matter what language you speak, with practice, you can acquire anything from a second language. Uh, it just takes practice. So, um, for example, even if you're 30 years old and you don't have a trill like the Spanish R in your language, you can still learn how to do a Spanish trill. It just might take a lot of practice. Uh, you might have to go to some place where you can do an ultrasound of your mouth and you can watch yourself do it. And you can have some guide show you with an ultrasound how to do it and actually work with your tongue, but it is possible. Um, you can learn grammatical patterns that are not in your language. It might just be tough. So it is possible. It's just not easy, so, but it is possible. So whether it's accidental or so accidental gaps and systematic gaps are more just like whether words exist or not within the language. That's not really about a human's capability of doing something in another language. Uh, even like perception, when we talk about babies, whether they can discriminate between sounds or not in another language, they lose that ability around six months, but it can still be trained later in life. It just takes a lot of practice. Um, like for instance, English speakers at the age of 30 can learn Mandarin tones. It just takes a lot of work because English isn't tonal, but it can be done. Uh, two, L2 errors are often systematic and follow a pattern. Uh, this is also true. 
So if you think about, um, I don't know, say, what types of speakers do you often hear around here? Uh, if I go to Surrey or if I go to, um, well, anywhere in Vancouver, um, there are speakers of a lot of languages that do not uh, use plurals in their native language. Or, um, oh, in the case, sorry, I'm, I'm talking a lot about Mandarin, but I know a lot of Mandarin speakers. Um, in Mandarin, there's uh, pronouns. So it, he, and she. So uh, they're all pronounced the same in Mandarin, but they're written differently. Um, but because they're all pronounced the same, uh, Mandarin speakers in English often make mistakes with he, she, with he and she when referring to people. Uh, they'll talk about a, per, a, a man and use the word she just as a mistake. Um, but it's systematic. It follows a pattern. It's because in their first language, they're pronounced the same. So in the second language, English, they make the same mistake um, because it's not, it's not a difference in the first language. So in the second language, uh, it's not a focus to make the distinction. So it's, it follows a pattern. You'll see these types of patterns on the second assignment as well. Uh, rolling your tongue isn't genetic then. Uh, that is correct. Uh, rolling your tongue is not genetic. Well, as rolling your tongue with the Spanish R, rolling your tongue is not the best way to describe what's happening there because your tongue isn't really being rolled. The tip of your tongue is flapping against the roof of your mouth because of airflow. That's actually what's happening. The blade of your tongue is being uh, held in place with your muscle and the tip of your tongue is loose and air is flowing uh, against the top of your mouth. So that just requires some muscular control and some practice, which is very tough. It's not easy, it's very tough. But if you've been doing it since you're one years old, it's a lot easier. Now three learners make work their way through a number of developmental stages. Uh, this is true. So just like babies, there's developmental stages, but the stages are not the same. And we'll talk about that in this lecture. And four, L2 errors can often be described by a set of underlying rules. Uh, this is also true. So all of these, again, were true. Um, errors can usually be classified. So um, this is often uh, influenced by your L1. So the first language that you learn has a big impact on the second languages that you learn because a lot of the patterns from your first language want to be brought into your second language. And a lot of the things that you lack in your first language that a second language has, you might have difficulties acquiring. So uh, sort of like with the Mandarin uh, pronouns. It can be quite difficult for some speakers to acquire pronouns unless a lot of effort is spent doing that. Um, so um, but Mandarin speakers will acquire them eventually, um, but some but some don't. It all depends on the person and it all depends on um, how much effort and focus is put on put into it. Okay. So usually when learning a language, uh, there's this stage called an interlanguage. And the interlanguage is where you spend a lot of time. So it's the stage where you haven't quite acquired the second language, but you're learning it. So um, it's, it's the stage where the L1 is bringing influence, the second language is bringing influence, there's other factors that are bringing influence, um, and there's some, some new things going on, there's, there's creativity going on in your own head, uh, so things that are not in your first language, not in your second language, but things you're just inventing based on how you think it should work. Um, you know, to, to produce something that you think is that language that you're learning. So uh, for example, suppose you have the word have in English. 
Well, a French learner may pronounce this as av, just av without the h, because French doesn't have the h. So what's happening is this is an L1 pattern, the fact that French doesn't have h, and it's being brought into English. So um, av is, so av is not French. So it's not the L1 and it's not English. It's not the L2. Um, instead, it's in this interlanguage form. Uh, it's being influenced by the L1 for not having H. It's being influenced by the L2, taking the word have, but it's in this interlanguage form where it's taking aspects of both. Uh, a German speaker might pronounce it a little bit differently. They might say half, half. So they have this F at the end. And that's because in German, it's really common at the end of words to take the sound like V and to change it to an F. So they don't like having voiced sounds at the end. So remember V and F. The only difference between V and F is that V has your vocal folds vibrating and F doesn't. So they don't like the vocal folds vibrating at the ends of words, so they just uh, stop the vibrations. So Germans would say half when they first start. So these are the interlanguage forms. So we get some influences here. So not all influence is bad. Um, we say that positive influence is called transfer. So uh, in this case, uh, we see an example of German and English where there's some positive influence or transfer. So for example, in German and English, the order of a noun phrase so determiners, adjectives, and nouns is the same. So English, we say the old man, and in German, we would do the same thing. So the old man, but that's written in German. So it's very easy for Germans to acquire English word order because the word order is the same in the noun phrase. But at a higher level, there's some interference. So this is negative transfer. So so sorry, negative influence. So, so positive influence is transfer and negative influence is interference. So in German, at the sentence level, um, adverbs appear after verbs. So ad, sorry, this, adverbs after verbs in German, like all the time, um, but in English, we cannot use always after verbs. So we cannot say he comes always on time. Oh, sorry. Uh, we'd have to say he always comes on time. He comes always on time. He comes always on time. He comes always on time. Is that bad for you? <laughs> he comes always on time. Is that bad for you? That's bad for you? Okay. So I'm having one of those grammatical crises right now where I'm like, that's, that's actually not that bad for me. But okay. This is my inner linguist. This is why syntax is, is weird. But it is super awkward to all of you. So I, I'll trust all of you because I don't trust myself when it comes to grammar anymore. Okay. Um, there was a question before. So is it possible to lose L1 and morph to L2? Uh, you will almost never lose your L1 unless you just completely stop using it for like a very long period of time. Uh, isn't it possible for second language learners to get the missing pieces in their first languages? Uh, why are French learners still have? Um, it is possible for second language learners to eventually um, get to the second language, but at first your patterns will very similarly resemble your first language. So um at the beginning uh a french speaker will likely say ev like i have it i have it but over time they will start to say have 
but at the beginning they'll take their patterns over until they learn and get comfortable with saying have and practice the sound. So yeah, in this case, uh, S means sentence. Sorry for that. And NP here means noun phrase. Which language is the best L1? No idea. That's really hard to answer. Uh, the best L1 is going to be the L1 that mostly resembles your L2 that you want to learn. I mean, I, ideally, I guess it'd be an L1 with a lot of patterns, but uh, a scrambling language might be pretty decent, but then a scrambling language, uh, you have so much freedom that learning a second language with structure might be difficult because a second language with structure doesn't have freedom. Um, so a, a language that most closely resembles the second language you want to learn is going to be best. So like the most common languages in the world are sentences or, or languages with word orders like um, subject, object, verb, and subject, verb, object. So having one of those as an L1 would be better. Uh, if you want to learn tonal languages, having an L1 with tones would be better. Why, why do English speakers find Mandarin so hard? It's because Mandarin has tones and English doesn't. So English speakers have to learn tones, which is uh, very difficult. Um, why do English speakers find Spanish so easy? It's because Spanish word order is so similar. The sounds are so similar. So English speakers find it very easy. Russian phonetics is very hard uh, for some English speakers, so they find it very difficult to acquire. So interference um, plays a lot into how difficult you can perceive a language. And transfer plays a lot into how easy you can find a language when picking it up as an L2. Now, as you learn a language, eventually you will stop making changes to your grammar. And this is usually the point where you say to yourself, um, I'm going to stop studying, I can communicate well enough. And this is when you say that your interlanguage has become fossilized. So this is when you're done, uh, you have stopped changing. Now to get to this point, um, people follow a general pattern, a general step-by-step -step process, but how fast you go along this process varies depending on um, motivation, uh, depending on immersion and all these other factors. So we're gonna talk about those factors as we go through. So what's the goal? What's the goal in a second language? Usually the goal is just to be competent. It's just to understand the language well enough to communicate with others. So we call this communicative competence, but in general, um, you know, most speakers also want to have some level of competence about the language itself. So uh, we talk about four different types of competence about the language. So we have grammatical competence, textual competence, sociolinguistic competence, and illocutionary competence. So grammatical competence is about the grammar itself. So this is stuff like how well do you understand uh, the syntax, the phonology, the morphology. So how well can you pronounce things? How well do you understand sentence structure? How well do you understand syllables? How well do you understand how to make plural fo forms, irregular forms, and so on? Uh, textual competence is about um, uh, more so about how to structure um, a bunch of sentences together or a paragraph or a dialogue. So these are things like cohesion. So usually when we think about cohesion, we think about stuff like essay writing, like how well do your thoughts string together? 
Uh, how well can you transition from idea to idea? How well can you follow a conversation and include yourself in it? Uh, Sociolinguistic competence um, is about how you can use language and how you understand how language is used within the culture. So uh, this could be like politeness within a language, uh, formality, uh, power structures, if there are gender differences in a language still, um, even things like turn taking. So uh, if you have an interview with someone, like how you're supposed to interrupt, uh, how often you're supposed to make noises. So example, if you listen to someone have an interview in English compared to someone having an interview in Japanese, uh, <laughs> it's very different. It's a very different experience. Listening to someone have an interview in English, there's not much interrupting. Uh, someone asks a question, the other person talks and talks and talks, and then it's over, and then the other person makes noise. Uh, in a Japanese interview, um, basically, after every contentful thing that the other person says, it's mm-hmm, 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 a variation. It's as if there's a lot of interruption. And English speakers would find it very rude, uh, while in Japanese culture, it's quite the opposite. It would be rude if the interviewer stayed silent. So that's sociolinguistic competence. The last one is elocutionary competence. Uh, and we have an example for this, but this is um, just understanding a speaker's intent when they're saying other things or making other gestures. Oh, not sure how familiar you are with this show. Uh, but here's, here's a nice exchange. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, there's a question first. Uh, would talking with new people or customers and your customer voice also be a part of sociolinguistic competence? Yeah, that's another thing. Like when you talk to your customer and how you treat them, um, how customers expect to be treated in a store, uh, that's part of sociolinguistic competence. A awareness of how people in society and culture expect to be treated and talked to. And that's not just a personality difference either. So, I mean, that is work personality versus home personality, but the fact that you've shaped that voice and shaped those sentence structures and shaped those words um, is based on cultural expectation and also language expectation. You know what customers expect, you know what your workplace expects, and you know how people expect to be treated and you expect to treat them. So, elocutionary competence. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan, I'm just overworked with my page duties and being Mr. Donnie's assistant. There's not enough work hours in the day. Tracy says, I'm sorry about that, but just let me know if there's any way I can help. Uh, actually, there is one thing. And Tracy says, no, I was just saying that. Why can't you read human facial cues? So there's like, uh, but just let me know if there's any way I can help. Okay. Uh, actually, there is this one thing. And then Tracy says, no, I was just saying that. So what we mean by illocutionary competence is understanding the actual intent of what people actually mean when they say things. So, but just let me know if there's any way I can help was not actually meant to say, um, I can help you. It's, it's, it's just a, an expression to say like, I'm sorry that you're doing that. I'm sorry that it's like that. He's not actually offering help. So when Kenneth responds and says, actually, I could use help, uh, Tracy's like, no, 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 no. I wasn't offering help. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't how it's supposed to go. Um, so that's an example of illocutionary competence. Understanding the actual intent behind people's messages. Um, it's sort of like in, um, in, in, in Britain, instead of saying, uh, hey, how are you? They say, y'all right? That's, that's their greeting. Y'all right? It's, it's a little bit different, but they're not actually asking if you're all right. They're just saying, hey, how are you? Or hi. So exactly what's been put in chat. If someone says, hey, how are you? And you say pretty bad, actually. That's kind of like, oh, what? Hold on. Why are you saying it honestly? You're not supposed to answer that question honestly. You're just supposed to say hi.
Okay. Are there any questions about the competencies or what has been discussed in the past seven slides? <laughs> when my parents say, hey, son, but they say you're a disappointment. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay, so the next bit is about L2 acquisition of the various different theoretical components of language. So things like phonology, syntax, morphology. So this is mostly about uh, transfer and interference. So um, it all follows along with the same principles. You know, we bring things from our first language. And sometimes this is harmful, sometimes this is beneficial, and we acquire things in a certain order. This is the, this is the general guidelines that follows us through all of L2 acquisition. So um, with adults, you hear accents. And why do we hear accents? That's because a lot of the patterns from the first language, the sound patterns is brought into the second language. So when you hear the, the, pronounced in English, the TH sound in English, the th and the the, I think I mentioned this before, but I didn't write it down. Only 2.7% of all languages in the world have these sounds, the th and the. That's a very low percentage of languages in the world. So many speakers who learn language or who learn English as a second language cannot pronounce these. So they'll make substitutions. Um, if you are a Quebec French speaker, uh, you don't pronounce th, you make it a d. If you're a German speaker, you make it a z. So instead of saying the as a Quebec French as a Quebec French speaker, you say d. As a German speaker, you say z. So I went to the store, uh, I went to the store, uh, you hear these. So let's actually listen to this uh, German Coast Guard trainee quite it's quite good so let me doo -doo -doo. i'm just gonna put it on this screen because i can see it here Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a classic. What are you thinking about? Um, but it's, uh, I mean, this, this is both a joke, but it's also something that can actually happen because this isn't also just a pronunciation thing. This is also a perceptual thing. This needs um, practice as well um, because um, Pronunciation is difficult, but at the beginning, when you learn, you have to do uh, perception practice because you'll just perceive the closest sound in your L1. Of course, with the language as good as he was speaking it, he would be able to perceive the word uh, sinking compared to thinking. So the, the actual application of it, he, he would be fine in reality. He would know the difference. He would just have difficulties pronouncing it. But yeah, you 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 could hear the the z instead of the the. So, sort of the last activity here, uh, we have this sentence: the bad guys tried to climb out and thought they had made it until they saw the dog. So let's think about what this sentence would sound like 
if we had some second language speakers who did some of these different processes, and we're not going to do these in IPA, we're just going to change uh, the letters and the words just to, you know, make these sounds. So I'm just going to type these out. Um, but uh, these are things that you should be able to do uh, just by thinking about the sounds. So uh, try to try to do them in your head as we go through. So uh, we're going to take the sentence, the bad guys tried to climb out and thought they had made it until the, they saw the dog. And we're going to devoice word final stops. So specifically, any word that ends with a B, we're going to change it to a P sound. If it ends with a D sound, we're going to change it to a D sound. And if it ends with a G sound, we're going to end change it to a K sound. So we're going to get the, and then bad d is going to change to a T. So we're going to get the bat guys, uh, guys, the bat guys. Try d d is going to change to a T. So tried to climb, that's fine, out. And that d at the end is going to change to a T. And thought, oh. uh, thought they had, okay, we'll change that D to a D. Uh, made, okay, made, that will change to a T as well. Uh, we have an E at the end, but the last sound is made. So we'll change it to mate. Uh, it, until they saw the, oh, until they saw the dog, well, G is a G sound, so we'll change it to K. So this would sound like uh, the bat guys tried to climb out and thought they had made it until they saw the duck. So uh, this would be sort of like a German speaker learning English at first. Uh, German speakers devoice uh, sounds at the ends of words. So a German speaker might say something like that. That would be one way the sentence could be altered. Uh, what if we change, uh, this is this how ac actors learn accents? Kind of, it's kind of how they learn accents. Um, they actually have speech trainers go through all the sounds and show them with ultrasounds or with the diagrams how to do it and really focus on a lot of words um, and, and learn stuff like linguists do. They, they train, they have linguists go in Linguists who focus on accents and speech sounds and, and work with actors. Uh, turn interdental fricatives into, uh, so th, t, s, and th, t, z. So basically you make them very close to s and z. So the becomes z. So we get uh, z, bed. Guys tried to climb out and that thought is going to become s, and thought they th is going to become z. They had made it until uh, they is going to become they saw the is going to be the dog. So the bad guys tried to climb out and thought they had made it until they saw the dog. So some of these are actually kind of fun. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have done this in your own time just to try it accents. Um, but this is, uh, this, is, this is real. People actually do this. Um, the interdental fricatives one is very real because interdental fricatives are very hard to pronounce. So this is a substitution you see all the time. Um, I'm going to let you try three and four on your own. Oh, sorry, three and five on your own, but I want to do uh, this one. Four. Insert a vowel such as uh after syllable final consonants. So I'm just going to use an E for this one because I don't have the symbol on hand. Uh, but you could do something like uh, the bad uh, guys. Uh, uh, tried uh, to climb uh, out uh, and uh, thought uh, they had uh, had uh, made uh, it uh, until uh, they saw the dog. 
So that could be how someone who has difficulties pronouncing syllables that end in consonants uh, could pronounce the sentence. I learned in another class that modeling a specific native speaker is another strategy used by actors. Yeah, that's another way. So, I mean, the more approaches is going to be better. Um, Wired YouTube has a lot of videos on actors' accents. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, like, if you have linguistic knowledge, it's going to help. If you understand the patterns, um, at least you're going to have a starting point. Um, if you model other people's accents, I mean, that'll help too. You'll get some good perception practice. You'll get some good mirroring practice. Um, the more knowledge you have is going to help, of course. And if you have someone personally training you, even better, because they'll have specific advice for tongue position, for specific words to practice, and so on. So we'll take another 10-minute break. We'll come back at uh, 4.35, and we'll finish up the rest of second language acquisition. If you have any questions or comments, as always, type them in chat, or we'll talk about them after the break. Keep going to the wrong screen. There we go. Okay, one question. Does the existence of the TH sound in a language affect whether or not speakers of that language might have a lisp? And are there similar pronunciation issues that are common in other languages that we don't have in English due to the presence of other sounds? Um, I don't completely know about the second part, but as far as the first part with the lisp, um, the lisp usually isn't always due to the TH. A lot of the lisps don't happen because of the TH, but happen on the S itself. And it's because the S is being pronounced too far forward. So the S is being pronounced against the back of the teeth. And there are some people that when they speak will pronounce um, these sounds, T, D, N, and S. They'll pronounce, sorry, I didn't type that to everyone. I typed that specifically to someone who messaged me privately. Um, I type, uh, so they'll pronounce T, D, N, and S all up against the back of the teeth when they speak. So, um, but the lisp happens. So, uh, so uh, sit, sit, sit versus sit. Um, uh, but the lisp, I guess, happens a little bit lower. So, sit, sit, sit. It's a little bit hard to do. Um, it doesn't necessarily happen because of the TH. So it can happen in any language with an S. It's just if someone pronounces it a little bit more forward. Uh, whether it's more likely or not, I'm also not sure about that. I know more about um, morphology and syntax than I do in phonetics. So a lot of the questions that are more based purely in phonetics, I'm not 100% sure if I can only make educated guesses about. Okay, uh, so that was sound changes, um, depending on L1 interference. Um, L1 can have an effect on syllabification too. So English has some very complex syllables. Uh, compared to most languages in the world, English has incredibly complex syllables. So if we take a look at words like streamed and glimpsed, and we convert them into IPA, uh, we get some CCC, VCC structures. So S-T-R, I is the vowel, then M-D, so streamed, very complex syllable, uh, glimpsed as well, G-L, I, and then we get four consonants in a coda. That is a giant coda. Uh, if we compare this to something like Arabic, 
Arabic only allows CVC consonants. Like that's the biggest or CVC syllables. Uh, that's the longest syllable you can get in Arabic. So if, if a speaker of Arabic has to pronounce something like glimpsed uh, and they're first learning, they're going to be making a lot of substitutions and a, a lot of extra um, additions in order to make this easier because they're going to want to produce something like CVCVCVCVC um, in order to pronounce it. They're going to have to break up all of those consonant clusters. Um, Mandarin speakers, in as far as codas go, though the ends of syllables only like having ends and ns. Um, usually when they say a word in English with an M at the end, uh, they don't have issues because they're nasals. Um, but other sounds like Ds and Ks and Ps, when they first start speaking, uh, might have some problems. Or Ls especially if, if you listen. So when they first start, and they see like a CVC, uh, they might just get rid of the C, the consonant sound, um, but as they get more proficient, they might add another sound at the end. So thinking about these strategies, so I'll, I'll write them again here, we're gonna ask ourselves, how would Arabic and Mandarin speakers resyllabify these words? So Arabic speakers would take CVC, um, and they would add E to make CVCs. And then Mandarin speakers would delete. So CVC, get rid of the C, or CVC, and then add a schwa at the end. So um, for an example, I'll do trend, and then I'll pass it over to you to try to do plate. Um, but with trend, if we think about this, we have C, C, B, C, C. The most that an Arabic speaker can do is C, B, C. So we'd have to insert a vowel here. And we would have to insert, well, we probably don't need a vowel between the N and the D, but we would probably need a vowel here at the end. So we would probably get something like uh, T, re, D, something like this. So that way, if we take a look at all of the syllables that we get, we get a CV, we get a CVC, and we get a CV. So we've taken a more complex syllabic structure, CC, VCC, and we've broken it up into something that's easier to pronounce. So if we take a look at plate, which uh, the EI here is just one sound. So this is C, C, V, C. Um, how would we have to rewrite this? So that way the longest syllable that we have is just C, V, C. So we're gonna put an I somewhere in this. Yeah, so some of so one of you has changed the word itself, one of you is an IPA, but yes, yeah, it's the it's the right idea here. So we would put the vowel after the first C so we could get um, P late. So then we get a C and a V, and then we get a C V C. So we've taken a complex structure, C C V C and we've just simplified it into something that Arabic speakers could pronounce. So something more similar to their first language. So this is something that Arabic speakers might do when they first start speaking English. Uh, what about Mandarin speakers? Let's think of the word bead. How would they first change this word? I mean, there's two ways they could go with this. They can either delete the final consonant and get B, or they could add a sound to the end of it, so that way they have like a CV and a CV. So they could get something like B, D. That's that way. Neither of those syllables has a consonant at the end of the syllable. It's just B, D. 
So that's one way they could do it. So thinking about the word sent. What we want in Mandarin is essentially CV or CV and then like a nasal at the end. So how could we change the word sent to get just CVs or CV and a nasal? So CV, nasal, and then a C. How could we modify this? Yeah, we could do send. That's one way we could do it. Just send on its own. Is there another way we could change this word? Is there some way we could change this word and keep the T? Senta, yeah. That would be another way we could do it. So sen is something you might hear early Mandarin speakers do, and senta is something you would hear um, intermediate Mandarin speakers do until, uh, I shouldn't even say intermediate, I should say like advanced beginners until they get more comfortable with the language and more practice, and then they get sent. So these are early strategies. Okay, any questions about these processes? Okay, above the syllable, there is stress as well. So in English, uh, words have stress. And there's two types of stress. There is uh, primary stress and there is secondary stress. Uh, in English, we usually denote, or in every language, we usually denote primary stress with like an accent going up and secondary stress with an accent going down. So in Polish, a primary stress is always on the second to last syllable. So um, in a word in English, we would say like doctor. And if you listen to the word doctor, doctor, uh, the first syllable is louder. So we would put stress on doc for doctor. Uh, or if you have the word, um, uh, Influence, influence, in has stress, influence. It's a little bit louder, a little bit longer than the rest of the syllables. Uh, to hear the contrast, we could change the stress and we could try to force it on flu. Uh, influence, influence, sounds a little weird. So we were not gonna worry about secondary stress here, um, but just primary stress. So if Polish speakers always put it on the second to last syllables, uh, what would these English words sound like if Polish speakers say them? Well, if it always goes on the second to last syllable, we would get Vancouver, Vancouver. Okay, well, this is, this is normal. That's good. <laughs> uh, but this word, which should be Vancouverite, we would get Vancouverite, Vancouverite. That's a little weird. Uh, what would be maintain suddenly becomes maintain, maintain. That's a little weird too. So uh, these two ones are weird. Uh, what would be Democrat, Democrat? Well, stress would be here for the Polish speaker. So we'd get uh, Democrat, Democrat. That's, a, that's another weird one as well. Uh, but the last one, astonish astonish uh, the polish speaker would also say astonish so uh, the polish speaker would transfer correctly in two of the cases but there'd be some interference in three of the cases so stress can transfer as well and and i hope it what i hope what you're seeing at this point is that uh, there's a lot of things that can transfer from one language to another and there's a lot to keep track of so in your head as you're learning, uh, yeah, you're going to be able to keep track of a lot of things and work on a lot of things, but there's also a lot that's just going to slip past. 
So you're going to make errors, you're going to make mistakes in some aspects of the language, and you can't tackle them all at once. Um, so when you do acquire a second language, when you do learn it, um, mistakes are inevitable. And um, what you have to aim for is competence, it's just being able to communicate and to work on things uh, in chunks. So now let's talk about syntax. Um, syntax is, is very broad. So we're not gonna to talk too much about it, uh, but we will talk about one interesting thing called null subjects. So if you speak a language like Spanish, uh, you're probably aware that you do not need to have a subject in your sentence. So for example, in English, you have to say something like, she speaks Spanish. You need a subject in your sentence. You cannot just say, speak Spanish. That is not a complete sentence. But in Spanish, um, you can either include the subject. Uh, you can say, ella, that's fine. Or you can just drop the subject altogether. So if you do not have a subject in your sentence, uh, this is called a null subject. So that means it does not appear in the sentence. Um, it is inferred. So based on the context, based on what else is said in the sentence, you can figure out who the subject is. So um, if you're a Spanish speaker learning English, at first it's very common to forget to say the subject because in Spanish you don't need it. So you bring that same thing over into English. Um, just like if you're in English learning Spanish, you'll also want to say the subject all the time in Spanish, but you don't need to. You can drop the subject. So um, what's interesting about this too is that when you ask speakers in Spanish uh, whether or not a sentence is grammatical or not in English, um, Spanish speakers will still judge English sentences with Spanish rules in mind. So a Spanish speaker will look at a sentence like speak Spanish and English, and a Spanish speaker will say, uh, yeah, that's an okay sentence. While speakers of other languages that don't allow null subjects will look at that English sentence and say, yeah, it's not very good. It needs a subject. So um, again, the rules of your first language will interfere with your second language. So um, there are many languages that, that do do this. So the question might be uh, for some of you, well, how, how can a language not need subjects? How can you figure out what the subject is if, if you don't have it in the sentence? So let's, let's take a look at this, shall we? Let's, let's take a look at this paradigm. So, on the left of each of these tables is uh, the subject. So this is the pronoun. And on the right of each table is the verb. So take a look at English. I play, you play, he, she, it plays, we play, you play, they play. And take a look at Spanish on the left. So let's just take a look at the verb endings. Oh, as, a, mos, is, an. Now, if we take a look at the verb endings in Spanish, what do the verb endings tell us? Well, the verb endings are all different. So because the verb endings are all different, we know based on the ending, which pronoun is being used. Because if it's most, uh, we know that we have uh, nosotros. We know it's we. Uh, if we have us, we know it's tu, uh, we know it's you. If it's o, oh, we know it's yo, we know it's I. So because the verb tells us what the subject has to be, we don't need to include the subject in the sentence. So this is what allows Spanish to be a null subject language. It allows Spanish to not include the subjects in the sentence because the verb contains that information already. It kind of goes back to redundancy. The verb contains redundant information, 
or sorry, or another way of looking at it is uh, the subject itself is redundant, so you can just exclude it, and Spanish allows that. But in English, if, if we just see the word play on its own, uh, that tells us nothing about what the subject is. We don't know if that's I, you, we, plural, you, or they. We have no idea. So even though logically, looking at play, we don't know what the subject is, a Spanish speaker will still bring that rule into English and say, ah, that's fine, we don't need the subject at the beginning stages, just because of L1, interfer or L1 interference. But again, as they learn the language, as they practice, that, that goes away. And eventually they say, okay, English sentences need a subject. Okay, morphology and vocabulary are the last two. Uh, not much to be said. Um, okay, question. If you're aware of these mistakes, does it make you less likely to make mistakes? Uh, the quick answer to that one is no. Um, if you're aware of the mistakes, a lot of conversational speech that you have is, um, I don't want to say like reflexive, but it's just natural. You don't think too much when you're just having a natural conversation. Um, if you're aware of the mistakes, you still have to put in a conscious effort to work on those. So you have to be very consciously aware while you're talking. So um, yeah, you'll be less likely to make those mistakes if you put in the effort and are consciously aware of your speech. But if you just continue to talk effortlessly and have conversations in everyday life and not think about how you speak, it's not gonna help you improve. So it depends on your attitude and it depends how much work you wanna put into it. But in the end, being aware of these mistakes is going to be advantageous if you care. So about morphology, I don't have too much to say about morphology. Um, the only main point I want to make is that in terms of acquisition, there is an acquisition order for morphemes in morphology in L2 as well, but the difference, uh, but there is a difference between L1 order and L2 order. Um, so for example, copula B and auxiliary B is acquired earlier, possessive is acquired later, irregular conjugations are acquired later. Those are just some examples. So there is a difference in order. The specific differences aren't really important, um, but babies and adults will acquire things in different orders. Uh, usually that depends on how it's taught in a classroom. As far as vocabulary, this is a little bit more interesting. Vocabulary is interesting because languages have different words and some languages have expressions and ideas that other languages don't have. So here's some German examples and some Jap and a Japanese example. Uh, so German has the word zeitgeist, so meaning the spirit of time. Uh, Schadenfreude is another one that you've probably heard before. It's a delight in other people's misfortune. Like we don't have words for that in English, but German has words for that. Uh, Japanese has a word that I think we've all experienced in English before, but we've never had a single word to express it. So, age uh, otori, to work, to look worse after a haircut. Um, yeah, we've for certain all experienced that before. Um, but yeah, Japanese has a specific word for that. So, sometimes it's difficult to acquire words in other languages when you don't have that expression. Um, or when words are treated differently in other languages. So in English, we have the words know and understand. And sometimes you'll hear or you'll learn in another L2 that they have words for know and understand, but they're used a little bit differently. Uh, like how knowing has a connotation to it and understanding has a connotation to it. And you have to use know and understand in different contexts than you would in English. And sometimes that's difficult to wrap your mind around. So again, that's where interference can come in.
Okay, so here's sort of the important part. And there's the question that most people have. Is it ever too late to learn a second language? How do I learn a second language faster? Uh, am I at a disadvantage learning a second language uh, because I don't know any second languages already? Is motivation really important or not? Can I learn a language just by reading a textbook? So yeah, uh, age, differences, cognitive factors, these are all things that can affect how quickly you learn a second language. So first of all, when you start learning a second language, is incredibly important. Depending on when you start can determine how native you're going to sound after you learn that second language. And unfortunately, if you start learning a second language now, you're probably not ever going to sound like a native speaker in that second language. Um, you can probably sound native-like in terms of syntactic structure, in terms of morphology, in terms of um, syllabification, but in terms of the sounds themselves and phonological processes, you will not sound like a native speaker. Um, and that can be quite disheartening sometimes and demotivational. Um, but again, remember the goal of learning a second language is usually to communicate, to do business, uh, to immerse yourself in culture. The goal is to communicate. So don't worry about not sounding like a native speaker. The goal is communication. So they will understand you. And that's the main point. You can still sound close to native like, but you will not acquire the exact sounds and get the same patterns. But with linguistic knowledge, you can work on it and you can get close. If you start young, you'll get closer to speech. So around the age of 14 is when that transfer happens. And the nice thing is this last bit that can hopefully leave a little bit of happiness in our hearts is that uh, there's no biological evidence yet that says that we can't be proficient in a second language. Uh, it's just that in general, we don't sound native-like. So. It does happen, just not often. And what the secrets are to that, I'm not sure what the secrets are. Uh, there's also a huge advantage for people who are younger. So people who are younger spend a lot less effort learning languages. You just have better um, pattern skills when you're younger. Uh, your, your neurons, you, I mean, there's there's a lot more neuroplasticity in your brain. So we don't talk about neurolinguistics yet. That's next week. Um, but you're just a better learner when you're younger. We'll simplify that. Um, uh, it's easier to acquire better pronunciation. So before 14. Um, yeah, those are the general, the, the the two big trends. So when you're younger, you generally have an initial advantage um, in terms of pronunciation and in terms of effort. Uh, but when you're older, uh, you might be able to learn a little bit faster just because you're able to acquire knowledge better. You have, uh, when we say older learners may show an initial advantage in terms of speed of learning, it's just because uh, you have practice learning compared to younger learners. But overall, um, does gender play a role in how fast they learn in L2? Uh, generally, no. We wouldn't say gender plays a role in how fast they learn in L2. Um, what's more likely to play a role is how outgoing you are um, and how much you are willing to talk with others and make mistakes. If you are someone who is willing to communicate with others and you're willing to use the language that you're learning, um, you will learn faster. If you're someone who's more reserved and doesn't want to communicate and just wants to write and read 
and practice in your head, then you will learn slower because you're not using it, because you're not willing to make mistakes. You're not willing to be judged. So some of those characteristics are correlated with gender, um, but gender itself is not responsible for that. That's just a correlation. And it's a very weak correlation. But overall, don't worry too much about age in the grand scheme of things. The biggest factor in learning any language is motivation. Uh, there was a question. I was at a talk uh, about five years ago in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And at the end of the talk, the dean at SFU came up and said, should we make language courses mandatory for every student in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences? And uh, being polite, as the person giving the talk could say, uh, they said no. And there's a very good reason why they said no. And that's because if a person doesn't want to learn a second language, they will not acquire the second language. And that's because motivation is huge. If you don't want to learn a language, you will not learn it. You need motivation. Motivation is the number one uh, indicator of success. And there's two main types. Uh, there's instrumental motivation. So this is when you want to learn a second language for a goal. Uh, usually this is a job or to do like education. So um, like a lot of people learn English to get into a university or to get a job or to teach English. So that's a specific goal. Um, the other one is integrative motivation. So this is because you want to immerse yourself into a culture or communicate with others. Um, both of these are reasons to learn a language and both of these will see you get the success uh, in terms of learning that language. But it's a fact that learners with high integrative motivation, so people who want to fit in with the culture and immerse themselves, tend to do better than people with low integrated motivation. And this is ignoring instrumental motivation. And I mean, this is just a fact about really anything with learning. Uh, if you're really into the subject and you immerse yourself in the subject, and you want to improve in the subject and you're not afraid of making mistakes and you want to communicate with others in that area, you will do better. So um, if you really want to learn a language, you will succeed. That's really the main point of this. If you don't want to learn the language and you take a course because you have to for a goal, you're going to struggle a bit more. And this goes with everything in life. Um, this is the same thing when you look online and find GPA boosters for courses too. Uh, a GPA booster is not a GPA booster if you don't enjoy the course. It's the same thing with learning languages. <laughs> You're not going to learn a language if you don't enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, one last little bit about L2 classrooms. So this is normally where you learn a language. Uh, typically, when most people learn a second language, it's in a classroom. It's not too often that you get to immerse yourself unless you have a lot of money or your parents have money and you get the opportunity to move somewhere. So one of the things, or one of the properties of L2 classrooms is that uh, you know, it is different than a real life situation where you get to be immersed in a language, in a culture. So you get modified input. Um, in other words, uh, you have one person, usually just a teacher, who can speak the language. So it's a native speaker talking to a bunch of non-native speakers. So one flu uh, fluent speaker versus a bunch of non-fluent speakers. Uh, the interaction is usually very directed. So we see it's modified interactive, uh, modified interaction. It's it's not like the real world. It's it's very set up. The vocabulary is limited. Uh, you're not being thrown anything weird or unexpected. Uh, and also, the focus in an L two classroom is not just on competency and communication. It's about 
form. It's about grammar. It's about getting specific patterns down. It's not just about, uh, you know, getting the item from the grocery store or ordering something at a restaurant and being successful. It's about learning that specific pattern. And then in the real world, you do it and suddenly it's like a big mess because you're focused on all these grammar rules. So there's a question. Do native speakers teach a language better or non-native or is there no difference? Um, that's a tough question. I mean, I think it's more about the training. Uh, a native speaker with training, a non-native speaker with training is going to do better than a native or non-native speaker without training. Uh, someone who knows the grammar of their language and can explain the grammar will do better than someone who doesn't know the grammar but just knows it intuitively and can't explain it. It also depends what you're going for. Uh, if you want someone who, if you just want to learn to read it and write it, it's not going to matter if it's someone native or non-native. Um, but if you want pronunciation, typically a native speaker will do better. But you want a teacher who is trained in the grammar of their language, the pronunciation, and all the linguistic aspects. Uh, that's going to get you the best success because they can actually talk. They, they, can, they can get over that hurdle of inaccessibility. And they can actually communicate different components that students are going to want to know about. Other than that, there's not going to be a difference as long as they're trained within the grammars and they have familiarity within the language. But, but, they, should, but they should at least know the language well enough. <laughs> I'm assuming the native speaker and non-native speaker can at least speak it fluently. If they're both fluent, there's no difference. If the non-native speaker is not fluent, obviously you want the one who's fluent. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like here's something you get in a typical L2 classroom. Like you don't get this in the real world. When you talk to people on the street, people don't ask you, oh, do you understand? What I just said, after you know they say something, uh, they don't ask you questions after they say something to you. Uh, they'll they'll say a few sentences and they don't ask you about what they just said. They don't test you. Um, they 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 don't re say what you said and correct you. Like if you say, um, uh, I, I go store later and get ice cream, uh, an English speaker in the street wouldn't repeat that same information with correct grammar. Uh, they would just say, okay. So you don't get any feedback in the real world like you do in the classroom. You don't get a test of understanding. Well, in the classroom, uh, you get that. So you get a lot more feedback in the L2 classroom than you do in the real world. And this can, this can be beneficial for some people uh, who are more advanced, who can actually correct themselves based off of these minor corrections from a teacher. But students who are really struggling, uh, this is a lot of information to take in and it's not gonna be too helpful for them. There's a little bit of information here, so I won't cover necessarily all of this. Um, but again, like in, in the classroom with the teacher, you're getting like very explicit feedback. Like you're being told about the language. Like there are two types of TH sounds, voice and voiceless. In the street, nobody's telling you this. Uh, in, in the classroom, oh, you use the voice TH. You're supposed to use the voiceless one. In the streets, people don't tell you that. They might listen to you and they'll say, those, those, oh, those. And they'll emphasize it and then continue on. Um, and actually for some people, that sort of correction in the street might be more helpful. If someone mishears you and you repeat it, then they emphasize and say, oh, those. Um, that might be more helpful than a teacher just saying, oh, you have to use the voice of the there, not th. So, um, you know, there are benefits to the differences in an L2 classroom, a controlled environment than an open world open world, sorry, I'm talking like a game here, than, than the real world. Um, 
So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, individual variation there too. So a little bit of information about individual variation here, if you do want to, uh, I mean, please, please read that here, but just a few minutes left. So I just want to make sure the rest of this is covered. Um, it's just, it's just one more slide. Okay. So in the past, um, just this last slide here. So in the past, um, it used to be that it was just language input that was important. That's what was believed. So uh, there was this complex model called Krashen's Comprehensible Input Hypothesis. And there's a little bit that went into that, but the main thing was that language input and just understanding it was the most important thing uh, for communication. And that's all you needed. As long as you had comprehensible input over time, you would just naturally be able to speak. So if you listened to 2000 hours of uh, television and you paid attention to it and you listened for the grammatical patterns um, and, and you know you took notes and you learned the rules, you would just be able to speak when you needed to. But we know this isn't the case. We need to actually produce language. Otherwise, when you're in a situation, uh, you're scrambling in your head to come up with things. Um, you can understand things, sure, but it's very difficult to communicate on the spot. So you need to practice it. And that's what builds um, you know, the correct sounds, the correct structure. That's what builds the speed in a conversation. That's what lets you uh, communicate effortlessly. So um, for input, you don't actually need to focus. And that's the problem. Uh, you can listen passively. So when you're listening to say 2000 hours of shows, uh, there are times that you zone out and you don't take in information. But when you speak, it's very difficult to speak without intent, without focus. So by speaking, you're forcing yourself to pay attention to grammar and rules and the mental lexicon and you're also forcing yourself to listen to someone else's response and listen to how someone else perceives how you're speaking. So you get a lot more feedback by speaking, uh, which is why when you talk to others and you make mistakes and you communicate and you embarrass yourself, you improve a lot faster. And that's why people who focus mostly on reading and listening uh, tend to progress with a language a lot slower than people who work on all four mediums. Um, so yeah, uh, this is really it for second language acquisition. Uh, the main goal being, or sorry, that the main overarching lesson of all of this, uh, not only just the content itself, but uh, if you want to learn a language, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Uh, motivation being the most important thing in order to be successful, but uh, the fact that you're going to make mistakes, that's very common. There's a lot of things to juggle, so you can't focus on all of it at once. And a lot of your L1 is going to come into your L2. So a lot of mental effort and conscious effort is going to be needed to overcome those hurdles. And some of those hurdles are a lot easier to overcome than others due to transfer and interference. So if you learn a language that is very similar to your first language, it's often quite easy because you have a lot of transfer compared to learning a language that's very different from your first language due to so much interference and so many things that that second language doesn't have, or sorry, that so many things that the language has that your first language doesn't have. Um, so I'm sure some of you, have, many of you have learned a second language. Um, if you've learned English coming from any of the Asian languages, it's, it's quite different uh, compared to say learning English from any of the European languages which is a little bit more similar, or I should say the Romance languages is quite similar to English and Germanic language is quite similar to English. Um, if you learn two languages that are very different, would it be easier to pick up a middle language since you can get input from both? Uh, so once you have two languages, your third language or fourth language and so on, they get easier. And that's because the patterns you get in your third, fourth, fifth languages become more familiar. So yeah, that middle language, that third language, um, 
is going to be easier because you start to recognize the two. And suddenly you're not learning as many new concepts. Um, so uh, one language might have a passive and the second language you learn might have an anti-passive. So in that middle language, maybe it has both. And now suddenly you don't have to figure out what a passive and anti-passive is because now you know what both are. So it was easier to understand what both of those are in that third language. It's just an example of two terms we haven't really talked about. Um, we're not learning about language families in this course this semester, um, just because it's just very heavy memorization stuff. Um, unfortunately. Uh, but with language families, it's basically just a giant chart of where all the languages came from. That's really, that's it's really about the extent of how that lecture would go. It's just a map and a bunch of languages from certain areas. Yes, so uh, there is a bunch of information on bilingualism after, but unfortunately we did not get to it and it will not be tested, but it is there if you're interested. Um, it does talk a little bit about um, some of the differences between, sorry, not some of the differences, but uh, how bilingualism can affect uh, first and second language acquisition. Well, how, how, how your two languages can suffer from that. But we'll talk a little bit about bilingualism in the neurolinguistic section next week. Okay, that's all I have for this week. If you have any questions, you can stick around. Um, but yeah, I'll have the webcam and everything fixed for next week. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the happy ubu face while it lasted. Uh, there is a practice exercise due next week. So it covers everything from last week and this week. Uh, and that is it. So that is due next Tuesday by 11.59 a.m. Like always. Ten questions. Assignments also available, so please check that out. Enjoy the rest of your week.